We don't know that much yet about how they behave, but what's really concerning is that some of these variants seem to have developed the same mutation independently of each other, which is really concerning because it means that this mutation might improve the virus versus ability to spread and survive. It's sort of akin to like the predecessors of birds and bats, both evolving to have wings because flying gave them an advantage, even though birds and bats are not, you know, really related to each other. Uh, it will take time though for both um, laboratory studies and for seeing how these variants behave in real life before we know whether each variant is really capable of being spreading more easily, causing more severe illness, whether it can reinfect uh, people who have already had an infection, um, whether it can escape the vaccines, which is what we're learning about uh, some of the other variants around the world. The UK variant seems to spread more easily. The um, South African variant, concerningly, seems to make some of the vaccines less effective and also seems to reinfect people who already had coronavirus. So it's really important though to invest in systems to do surveillance for variants, which is not really being done a lot yet in the US, but it seems that the uh, Biden administration is committing a lot of funds for that. All right, and we're also talking about the CDC constantly revises its guidelines. And now they're saying that people who are fully vaccinated um, can actually skip quarantine um, if they have been exposed to the virus. So can you talk a little bit more about those guidelines? Yeah, that's right. So since the vaccines are remarkably effective at preventing infections, and as we start to see more data that they are also seem to reduce asymptomatic transmission, it's reasonable to eliminate the quarantine period for people who are fully vaccinated starting at two weeks after the second dose and up to three months after vaccination. Public health officials really have to balance the prevention of transmission against the impact of quarantine on people's lives. And because transmission is so much less likely after vaccination, there is much less benefit to quarantining. So uh, you know, I think that this is very reasonable. I would be cautious about applying this to immunocompromised populations where we don't know yet about how effective the vaccine is for them. Based on the variants and how much more contagious they are, do you think the state should be reevaluating potentially its reopening guidelines? Or if we stick to masking and social distancing, you think we'll be okay? You know, it is really concerning uh, that what we're hearing about these variants, but at the same time, they haven't changed in how they're transmitted. They're all still transmitted by respiratory droplets. And we know a lot now about how to prevent transmission through respiratory droplets. So, you know, I really think we need to just double down on the guidance that we've had all along, especially diligent masking, ventilation and being outdoors, hand washing and spacing. Uh, many infections are occurring from people getting together at home or in private gatherings. And there's really only so much that closing businesses and uh, preventing people from uh, being in schools is going to prevent transmission in those settings. So um, really what we need to do is stick to the basics and see if we can uh, um, uh, do uh, open safely without increasing how much people are spreading the virus in private settings. Remember that the more virus that spreads in the community, the more trans chances the virus has to produce new mutations that it can test out on the minority of people who have been vaccinated. So, um, or, or people who have already recovered from the infection. So the key is still to reduce transmission by sticking to those basics. And we have lots of data now on how it can be done safely. And as the ball slowly kind of gets rolling on the vaccines and more people are being vaccinated, we're hearing a little bit more about the side effects. Um, are the side effects the same for the, diff the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? Um, and how do they just overall compare to say side effects for a flu shot? The side effects from the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines seem to be really similar to each other. Most people will have a tender spot where they got the shot and maybe some redness and swelling in a bunch of other people. Um, and some will have fatigue, fever, joint aches, you know, maybe something a little bit more marked. Um, these side effects seem to happen more after the second dose and they happen more in younger people. Uh, and, uh, and the side effects seem to happen more often than with the regular flu shot. But as far as severe allergic reactions, they remain extremely rare, about four or five per million uh, of the Pfizer vaccine and two and a half per million for the Moderna vaccine. 
they were almost all within 30 minutes of the vaccine, and there have not been any allergic reaction related deaths. And you know, just to, to as a uh, comparison, uh, there have been 1,500 deaths per million people in the U.S. from COVID. So, you know, the relative risks of the vaccine uh, are nothing compared to the infection. We know that um, you know the side effects. If we feel them, we know that it's working. Um, so, should we be concerned if we don't feel any side effects? Fortunately, you don't need to worry about that. Not having side effects doesn't mean that the vaccine is not working. You know, for example, uh, older people in the trial, in the clinical trials for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines had much less in the way of side effects, but they had similar efficacy. So uh, do not worry that if you don't have any side effects from the vaccine, then it's not working and that you need to go get, you know, tests done. So, you know, have faith. 